So have British universities become combative of lad culture? Today, debating this topic, I'm pleased to welcome Milo Yiannopoulos, broadcaster and columnist, and Dr Theo Kalorius, a senior lecturer in media studies and critical theory. So welcome. So firstly, Milo, how would you describe a lad? Um, well, I think in this debate, lad, lad culture is um, used to mean boys who have a particular set of, of boisterous behaviours that mm -hmm. some people think are causing problems for women or maybe difficult for women to relate to or engage with. But really, it's um, I would just describe it as young men letting off steam in an entirely appropriate and healthy way. Okay, and Theo, what would you say to that? Um, it, it, it is an interesting answer. Um, I, would, I would suggest, however, that it is, uh, it, it, it is a complex cultural phenomenon which has, um, in, in my view, uh, rather deep um, sociocultural and political roots. Um, and I would, um, if you didn't mind, I mean, w w I'd, I'd like a bit more of an explanation as to what you mean by boisterous. Sure. Um, well, I think in a wider context of the way that boys are being treated in society and education generally, um, men of my generation didn't experience any sort of structural disadvantage by being men. In fact, society has been architected the other way around for really quite a long time. But society is changing and changing very quickly. I don't think lad culture and boisterousness is a particularly compli complicated phenomenon. I think it's very simple. Um, it's happened you know, since there have been men, um, men have let off steam in adolescence. Um, it's, it's, very, it's very straightforward, really, that um, while men are growing up in school, being increasingly whacked on Adderall and Ritalin and Modafinil in American schools because they're held up to feminine standards of behaviour. Um, if they let off steam or tear around or go a bit nuts, you're kind of getting, getting that energy out of the systems as all young boys have to as they're finding out you know, what it means to be a man and how to deal with this sort of excessive energy and all the rest of it. They're increasingly, um, as I say, being diagnosed according to feminine standards of behaviour. Um, that's not normal. It's very damaging to men's psychology to, and ultimately damaging to women too because these men grow up uh, be, becoming the sort of men that women don't want to, to marry. Okay, Theo, would you then say that lad culture is something to be concerned about? Well, if, if we agree that ladism can be uh, considered, um, how can I put it, an extreme form of masculinity or one aspect of a, a, a multiple context or multiple concept that we call masculinity, if it is an extreme um, uh, um, an extreme construct of it, then of course we should be worried. Um, but again, Milo, I mean, I, what, what, what is it, I mean, that, that, that men do or should do in order to feel, to let, what, what do you mean by letting off steam? I mean, I let off steam when I was younger, you know, I can't let off any steam at the moment. But <laughs> it's younger, harder as you get older, I, I right? Did, I, I did let, <laughs> you know, um, off steam, but I, I was never offensive, mm. you know, um, I never sort of, uh, I was never presumptuous and uh, never considered to be my right to more or less um, force women to behave in a certain way, so to speak, or treat women. I don't think this debate is actually about women um, at all. I don't think it has much to do with women, and I think women injecting themselves into it is part of the problem. Um, boys let off seem in a certain way. We hear constantly from feminists and other minorities about the safe spaces that they need in order to have debate or simply exist uh, un. Uh, unworried but, uh, from you know, outside influences and able to just do what they want and behave what they want. Lad culture is actually a safe space of its own and, and its own kind. It's a very poorly understood one, uh, like uh, forum culture and chan culture on the internet, which is also a version of a safe space. It's just a safe space for men. Now that concept sounds a little weird to us. So why would why would you know a straight white male need a need a safe space a safe space at all? Don't they run the world? And until very recently, they did. But things are changing quite quickly, and it's it's left some young men feeling quite disorientated. Um, for example, you know, women under thirty in the UK and the US now earn more for the same work in jobs. Boys are, as many young men feel, and again, it's not something that my generation necessarily experienced, but lots of young men feel as though the world of work and the world of education is engineered against them. There are programs for women, there are scholarships for, for women, there are special uh, quotas for women even in some, in some companies, and men don't find that to be particularly fair. So the, seeing all of this in, in, in context I think is important. Men need their own safe spaces too. They need a, an environment in which they can 
as you, uh, let off steam, and by let off steam, yeah, I mean, be loud, get drunk, play sports, you know, and none of these things are uh, intrinsically offensive. I think you have a, an extraordinarily broad definition of offensive, if you, if you find that to be difficult, okay, problematic. You. I agree with you entirely. You know, what, what's wrong with, you know, being boisterous and getting drunk and, you know, letting off steam? But when that sort of um, um, uh, imposes on, on, on women's um, understanding of themselves and the... How does it? Well, I mean, how can I put it? I mean, I could, I could be graphic if you like, but when Please. in a pub, you know, um, um, you've got uh, drunk young men, you know, and mind you, I'm not saying, I'm not putting myself out of this. You know, I, I used to do it too when I was younger, but um, not, as I said, I wasn't offensive, but, you know, when there is a situation in which a man considers it his right, a young man considers it his right to more or less presume that a woman is there for his pleasure and his pleasure alone, then whether the, there's the problem. I mean, I've got... I would, agree, I would agree with you entirely. I simply don't think that's what's happening. Uh, I think the view that you're, uh, the picture you're painting is 20 years out of date. My experience writing on this subject and, uh, and looking into it and speaking to young men over the last couple of years paints an entirely different picture. It paints a picture of men who are very worried about approaching women. They're worried about being laughed at, about being branded creepy, about being even, in extreme cases, accused of being rapists or potential rapists. Men now have to go to university and and, um, and join compulsory consent classes. The uh, you know the underlying sort of background to which is you're all potential rapists. My experience actually has been that it's precisely the opposite of the case. In lad culture, this retreat into alcohol in the company of other men is a response to that. If lad culture is getting worse, it's partly as a result of the messages that men have been sent for a decade, perhaps two decades, that they are all dangerous potential rapists and the sorts of things that you're suggesting that boys just being boys are somehow negatively affecting women um, is partly the result, I'm, I'm not, but I'm, part is, is part of the problem here. I'm not suggesting that at all, but I'll, 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 because you, you said a couple of things that were interesting just now, you said that, that you know, white men were running the world. I mean, who's running the world now? What I said precisely was that things are changing very quickly and that they started changing in the last 10 years very fast. And it's a generational change. Do you men, men, men and women under 30, for example, now, as I, as I, as I mentioned, more? earning more for the same work in the UK and the US. That is a huge change, and it's a change that's happened very recently. So sure, perhaps in most positions of power or the rest of it, I'm not, familiar. Majority, uh, I'm, I'm not familiar. I mean, I'd, I'd like to see some data for, you know, the fact that women under 30 and more now in some cases. Because in all cases for the same work, it's not a particularly contested I've, statistic, but I'm very I, happy to send it to I've, you. I've got, I've got the gender equality report that last year's, mm -hmm. you know, that it was commissioned mm -hmm. in the UK. Um, the UK at the moment is, I mean, the, the study was, was carried along four criteria, which was political empowerment, educational attainment, economic participation, and health and survival mm -hmm. between men and women. Women, uh, the UK at the moment uh, comes, mind you, the UK is one of the eighth richest nations in the world, and out of 136 countries, the UK is 29th when it comes to political empowerment, uh, 31st when it comes to educational attainment, 35th when it comes to economic participation, and 92nd, 92nd when it comes to health and survival of women. That is below Cuba, Lesotho, and South Africa. Which, which is an extremely well, maybe we should swap jobs these are all very good headline grabbing journalistic uh, nuggets from the report well, they're not journalistic well, many, well, well it, you've oh. selected them in a, in a very um, <laughs> very journalistic fashion so you've done a good job uh, you should be a headline writer but the point is that you know many of these reports um, tend to fall apart on closer scrutiny for example we're constantly hearing about the wage gap which I'm sure was a large part of um, many of these reports which have a specific one you're talking about um, the gender gap is constantly mentioned we said that women earn depending on whose figures you believe, 77, 82, even 68 cents to the dollar, um, pence to the pound on what men earn. But what these things don't take into account is the different life choices that women make and the different choices that women make in work. Women, for example, even women who don't have children, choose to work fewer hours, take longer holidays, and don't earn as much for their firms. They don't want to work as hard. They don't perhaps have that competitive, autistic, obsessive streak that men have. And as a result, they're compensated accordingly. Now. Um, Obviously, everyone that believes that if you're, you know, uh, somebody who's struggling on a low-paid job, that a woman should be paid the same as a man. But in those professions, which skew the statistics quite significantly and quite dramatically, um, where performance-related pay comes into it, and particularly taking into account the simply the different life choices women make, um, that gap narrows to a penny. Uh, and, and so ask, many of these reports are based on these okay. sorts of memes that get reported. Last month, Obama said it, you know, about, about uh, rape on campus, a totally discredited s statistic that seems to get worse every time you hear it, with no basis in fact. Well, 
Okay. Okay, so bringing this back to the university then, the National Union of Students defines lad culture as sexist, misogynistic and homophobic, at its extremes, rape supportive attitudes, sexual harassment and violence. So what would you say to that? What's definition? a rape supportive attitude? No one supports rape, it's ridiculous. I mean look, the NUS is famously one of the most left-wing organisations in the country. They support every wacky, crazy idea um, that comes along. In the last NUS women's conference they said that um, they passed a motion saying black men should stop appropriate, uh, so that, that gay men should stop appropriating black female culture. You know, the NUS is not, you know, what the NUS defines lag like culture is really doesn't interest me because if they do know the reality of what's going on on campus, they deliberately misrepresent it for polit political ends. And, you know, frankly, I, I think we can do a little bit better in our, uh, in our authorities. Okay. But why, why do you call it a wacky lefty? You know? Well, passing a, passing a motion um, saying that they were going to actively work to stop gay men from appropriating black female culture is wacky. It's, it's wacky. In, in what way is it lefty? It may be wacky, but in what well, way Well, because is it it's lefty? wrapped up in the sort of tired identity politics of the 60s and 70s that the left loves so much. I agree with you. This, this intolerance Olympics, the oppression Olympics, the, I, I, you know, the, the, the privileged nonsense that you know, really should have died out in the 60s and 70s, but which for some reason is still with us, but almost exclusively on the page of The Guardian and in places like the NUS. I, I, think, I, think, I think we'd be more... It, it would be quite revealing to, to refer to one of your writings here, the Sex Edis, which, which yep. I read on, is it on Primart? Yeah, Primart. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what I was astounded, I was astounded by two things. First of all, it's probity. It's ex extremely sort of probing. On the other hand, I, I thought it was extremely sort of misplaced. And its conclusions are completely... Um, Shaky. I mean, I would I, I would argue, for instance, this chap Rupert, that uh, you perhaps interviewed German German mm. guy Rupert. I mean, what in the first paragraph he mentions meaningful retirement. There's no meaningful retirement for men, yeah, mm -hmm. for young men. Mm -hmm. um, there's no prospects of unemployment, and there's extreme poverty. Mm -hmm. Now, in your in your um, um, article. Instead of actually sort of building a rather coherent critique of who's to blame for these things, he actually attacked the, the radical feminists, not those who have misappropriated, you know, people's wages, not not those who, um, instead of actually serving people's interests, you know, bailed out banks and then transferred um, public debts onto private debts. Uh, or private debts onto the the public, the, the shoulders of the of the, of the people. So yeah, I think, I think I know but, but but you know the radical feminists, and then you go on to use Camille Paglia, who you know um, she is a very famous scholar, but she has been nothing short of derided by sort of um, how can I put it um, scholars who are you know more or less serious. You know, I mean, she's a she's a big name undoubtedly, but that does not mean that that in any way she's she's a she, she's a biological determinist who out out biologizes Freud himself, if you like, and 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 uh, suggests that everything boils down to biology. And I'm sure you know that I don't I don't know whether you agree. You know, whether biology is destiny. I mean, that's a ridiculous sort of claim. Well, a critical theorist professor would say so. Um, I mean, first of all, I think that you know Camille Pellier, who is you know one of the foremost uh, feminist academics of her generation. She certainly, dissidents. she certainly, um, well, she uh, she and people like Christina Hoff Summers describe themselves as dissidents because they speak against uh, a consensus which has become very unhealthy, ossified. Um, in fact, the feminist establishment, which is and and some feminists. Um, sort of tenets of faith, like campus rape statistics, is precisely the reason I go after these people, because their crazy, unsubstantiated nonsense becomes government policy. That's where the bad laws are coming from. I would from. argue the That's where the laws opposite. come from. That's yeah. where the last... Well, if you're coming from a position, um, you know, of, of criticising the sort of authorities and structures that have given rise to imbalance in favour of men, um, you would have been right until really recently. You would have been right. How recently? But within a generation. And this so is we're the talking point about of my last article. Twenty years. This is the point of my article. So when I was a kid, for instance, we know because I grew up in the very late nineties, I suppose. Well, as I said earlier, our generation probably didn't experience it. And to say that men were structurally dis um, structurally disadvantaged or that society was architected against them for anyone of, of our age would be ridiculous. But it isn't ridiculous anymore. And young men, with some justification, feel as though society is beginning to be engineered against them. Um, I think you know the purpose of that piece um, was to examine where some of these problems have come from, and they primarily come from. Uh, 
feminists who repeat these memes about campus rape, these memes about wage inequality, none of which are really true. Um, and most most people in, you know, instinctively know are not mm. true, which is why so few women now identify as feminists, fewer uh, than one in five. Yeah. So the purpose of the piece, to answer the two points you make, the purpose of the piece in, in the first place is to lay some of the blame for the breakdown of relations between the sexes, yes, a radical feminism, which is where I think it, that blame belongs. Um, and many feminists, not just people like Camille Pelia, who of course you consider um, uh, you know, an antichrist, but many feminist professors have come out in the last couple of months saying that some of these tenets of the left, identity politics and the silencing and the no platform and all this kind of stuff, all of which feeds in to the sorts of things that disadvantaged men just in the last generation, have gone a little too far on campuses. I agree with you that identity politics has gone a bit too far. But the problem is not to be found with radical feminists, uh, in my view. It has to be found with total and utter abdication of public discourse when it comes to issues of class. You know, the, the problems that you, that, you, you, that you quote Rupert, you know, in terms of um, us saying, you know, meaningful retirement, employment, poverty, and so on, you know, have nothing to do with radical feminists. The fact that men, you know, um, I, I read a bit further down, that who commit suicide and are forced to actually take themselves out of society at large, you know, are not driven by radical feminists or because they cannot talk to girls in clubs. They're driven because there are no prospects out there. And the reason because there are no prospects out there is because there's been a massive onslaught of neoliberalism on... Okay, well, on that's, I think that takes us outside the scope of the, of the discussion at the moment. What, what I was just seeking to establish is that we're, we're perhaps one of the few things that might keep men in society, which is, you know, love of a good woman, as it were. Yeah. Um, you know, the relationships are being denied to them as well, as a result, I think, of the her of the legacy of the last, you know, 50 years. I'll just say this, and then we can, the take it, we can take it's it back to It's interesting that you saying. mentioned class, because what strikes me when you talk about, you know, well, I was never offensive, I never behaved like this, and then you have a go at lads and boys what, in, what, what, I, what I'm hearing is a middle class university professor sneering no, at no, no. working you're class being, No, no, you're being presumptuous. Well, that's, well, that's what I'm hearing no, no, because, no, no. you know, well, it's no. interesting you say this because what, what keeps coming up, you know, in my research and when I talk to people about this is not that it's a boy-girl thing or a left-right thing or a libertarian versus authoritarian thing. This is a class war. There's a certain kind of person and it is always reflected in the very solidly middle-class background I feminist academics. Well, I want to say that, um, I mean, just, just, just this thing, you know, um, that... That, that was a presumptuous thing. I do not come from a middle class background. I come from a very uh, working class background and came to the UK to study and um, uh, result in my per present position. But I, I, I think you would do uh, you know, the public a great service if you were to employ your admittedly uh, probing um, powers into um, uh, you know issues that I just mentioned, issues of class, issues of poverty. What is um, to, why is it that at the moment you know um, Britain scores so low when it comes to um, the equality index, for instance? You know the the, the latest. Um, well, I need to know specific. Claim, I need to know specific claims in that because the, you know the, the vast majority, as I say, the vast majority of. Um, received wisdom in those reports from which the ratings are derived um, simply break down on the most cursory of examination. So I'd have to think about that. I'm, I'm grateful for your professional recommendations. I'm lucky enough to have graduated and not uh, not necessarily need to, to follow them. Um, but uh, no, I mean, I, I think we should talk more about class because I think what's happening here, you may come from a working class background as by some definitions I probably do, but um, you're not working class now. And um, what I hear when people say this kind of stuff is um, a sort of turning up of the nose and a, sort of, and a sort of, oh God, how can they behave like that? Which you were sort of a pain to no, do no, about no, three no, times. Well, you know, I let off steam, but I wasn't boisterous and I wasn't like, you know, I wasn't like sort of seeking to distance yourself from those kinds of behaviors in which there is no shame. There is no shame in wanting to have sex with sexy women. There's no shame in wanting to get drunk in, on a Friday night. But, but there's no shame there in being loud. There's no shame in you know making a mess on a Friday but, but night. Listen, I mean, those, um, those, and you spoke as if there were. Those, and I find it very interesting. Myla, those who are the most boisterous of them all are the upper class delinquents. The type no, they're just the ones. Who, rule, they're just the ones you hear about. They're moment. just the one you. They're just the ones you hear about. How many people are actually in the Bullington Club? Compare that to what happens on the high streets the of Oxford. It's not just Bullington Club. I'm, I'm no, mean, but you're, well, no, I'm, what I'm, you just <laughs> said is the people who behave like that most are, for want of a better word, privileged people. They're not. It's just they're the ones you hear about. Go out to the streets of Cardiff or Newcastle or Liverpool. It's the same behaviour. Everybody does it. It's just that they're the people who get reported about because it's newsworthy. I think it's a ridiculous statement to say that you know, the, the people who are most guilty of it, the people with privilege, they're the people least guilty of it. Middle-class kids, you know, if, if 
have, if they have no other defining characteristic, it is timidity. It's just the loudest of the um, middle class and the loudest of the upper class who get reported on it because it's a sexy reporting subject. Mm. The vast majority of this behaviour happens I, to the working classes. I, I, I really didn't. I mean, I would really like to ask you, I mean, you know, do you have any female friends and who would actually say to you what, what they would like, to, any women who would actually say, um, um, <laughs> what kind of behaviour would be permissible? You know, if you could just define the parameters a bit. I mean, what kind of behavior would be permissible and not, um, you know, what, what does a woman have to do in a club, for instance, in order to, um, um, you know, feel not, not safe? In other words, let's say somebody is being boisterous in a club. Mm -hmm. Yes, you know, the, you know, I love the word bo boisterous, by the way. So at, at what point does that person, does that young man become offensive? Um in your estimation? <laughs> I don't think that's a very difficult question to answer. Um, I'm, I'm guessing that you would draw the line sooner than I would. Um, I would. I always go back to this great debate on Newsnight between the woman whose name I've forgotten, unfortunately, who set up the Everyday Sexism Project, which is a typic typical of the uh, sort of ridiculous misandrist um, miniaturism of modern feminism. You know, totally absurd, mostly fictitious complaints from women about men on, for the most part, simply being men. She's a typical example of what I call, you know, problematic. So you uh, think there's a misandry, you know, that women, these women I mean, hate we've got, men. We've got ourselves into a situation where lesbianic third wave feminists and gay guys are having a debate about how men and women should interact. Why am I even here? The reason I'm not here is that men get fired for having this sort of discussion. Men aren't allowed to talk like this. Men aren't allowed to say these things. When I said, when I went on BBC and, um, you know, feminists said, we're talking about women and you're, you're not allowed to have a voice in this. And I said, well, now we're talking about men. So maybe you'd like to pop down. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, you'd these are like not, to, these are not to, helpful statements, I agree with I, you. But. No, but what I was trying to do was demonstrate how ridiculous it is when you know feminists say only women can talk about these issues, but they also want to talk about men's issues, and they are horrified when any man suggests that they might, they might want their own space. You know, what, I don't know. And I guess it imagines, I guess it depends on the circumstances, the context, and the boy and girl involved, what specific things would be considered to be uh, going too far in a nightclub. What I do know is that there are more unhappy single women than ever before. There are more unhappy single men than ever before. And in this article, and I think in some of the stuff that I've written and broadcasting I've done recently, I've tried to explain how why feminism with the best of intentions um, has probably gone off the rails slightly and has resulted in bad outcomes for men and women. Um, okay, <laughs> so Milo, so from our interview with Martin Dobney, he described Britain as a nation that's becoming publicly anti-bloke. Do you mm -hmm. believe that men are in a crisis? What's your opinion on that? Um, I do think there's, I don't think society is anti-men. It may get there pretty soon. I do think it's anti-bloke, um, and I think it's a shame because what we really talk about with blokes is, uh, and blokishness is sort of men in its, men in their unreconstructed, you know, purest form without the sort of dressing up a polite society. There's not really very much um, wrong with that. There's not much of it on TV, I don't think. But, and when there is, there's sort of huge outpourings of, of support, like Jeremy Clarkson, who had a million signatures before even anyone knew what had happened, asked, you know, saying, keep him on top gear. It took no more page three, two years to get 250,000 signatures. It took Jeremy Clarkson uh, two days to get the same amount, and then it quickly went up to a million. There was an enormous si uh, sort of, if you like, in a silenced majority okay. on these sorts Thank of issues. You, what would you say? What was the question? Sorry, I was just laughing at the um, the unreconstructed sort of archetypal masculinity. So, kind of thing. do you think that young men are in a crisis, or what do you say? To I, you? I, I don't think young men are in, cri are in crisis. I think young people are in crisis. You know, be it men and women. I mean, um, university higher education has been corporatized. Um, you know, um, we have to work uh, more hours for less money. You know, you probably have to work until you're until you're seventy. You know, to get a decent pension. And um, yeah, I think I think we're in a crisis, but not the kind of crisis that Milo. You know, and certainly I disagree with Milo categorically. Right, it is, you know, the, um, the, the fault of radical feminism that, uh, that does that. I didn't seek you know? to lay, lay the blame for the whole thing on feminism. I said it's one aspect of the, of, the, of the breakdown in relations between men and women. I wasn't really speaking about the wider economic issues, which I think is probably outside the scope of the debate today. Mm. I know that you seem very keen to talk about that, but that's not really what we're here to discuss. Um, we may find some common ground on that subject, but it's not really what the article was about. Um, I'm speaking strictly about the breakdown in relationships and, and in relations between the sexes, which I think has demonstrably got much worse. I think we are in a, we're in a 
a gender crisis, uh, or you know, we're in a crisis of sexuality, in a crisis of sexual relations, um, like we haven't seen for 40 or 50 years. Okay, Theo, would you say that there was a narrative on British campuses that lad culture was a problem? Well, certainly. I mean, you know, the, 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 there are studies. I mean, much to my shame, I haven't sort of read many, and I, I and I haven't been um, within circles that um, such things have been um, um, alleged or sort of uh, supported in any way. However, you know, if you've got studies that are produced, I mean, this one was by the National Union of Students that Milo doesn't like very much, and and Sussex, um, Sussex University, that runs to 80 pages, you know, with qualitative analysis of 40 women which, you know, um, all allege that have been, um, have had problems with um, masculine boisterousness. I mean, just... While you're funny, I'll put pop in. Um, yeah. I've read that report. It's uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a wonderful uh, waste of paper. I, t I too, to my shame, printed it. Um, you know, and yes, it is long, but it doesn't say very much. Um, you know, if you ask people to whine about uh, about pretty much anything, you'll find forty women. Uh, I think the more more important are the sort of indicators like rape on campus. You know, which give a real indication of whether, as the left says, certain sorts of cultures and art have this power to make people sexist or make people violent. It used to be the old religious right, right who would say that particular things in society, you know, sort of cultures in society or art on TV or whatever uh, needed to be banned or censored because they made people behave in immoral and, um, and socially unproductive ways. Now it's the left. Uh, the left wants to ban certain video games, it wants to censor comic books, to go back and retroactively add you know, transgender characters to comic books in the name of diversity and ban books with, you know, ban, ban stuff with too much violence or sexism because it's it says that violence and sexism can uh, can shape who people are. The science on that, frankly, is very much out. In the case of video games, for example, you know, there's some, some evidence that violent video games make people nicer. Um, this report, you know, cherry picks a bunch of whinging, which you could just as easily have done the other way around, uh, and doesn't take into account any of the, if, if it had any integrity, it would have taken into account the fact that many of the statistics and memes that we hear about, this one, on five, one in five, one in six women on campus, I mean, uh, who get sexually assaulted, just bears no relation to reality and isn't true. And if they wanted so, to really find out the truth behind any of these things, they would have been intellectually honest. It is um, one of the most uh, purposefully disingenuous pieces of research I've read in a very long time, which, you know, I'm sure they've all got very bright futures in the Labour Party, but it's not a particularly uh, interesting work of scholarship. You're not saying that Labour is left, do you? Or that somehow that Labour is left? Because well, I'm sort of getting if, the, if, if, if you do, I'm getting the impression, that, I'm getting the impression the that you're pro you probably think Cuba's um, uh, <laughs> is, a, is a sliding into neoliberalism, I don't know, but, um, uh, you know, I'm just making a So, Marla, why point. would you say, why do you think that people see lad culture as detrimental then, why would you say? Well, I th you know, people, as I said, there's a wider, there's, a, there's a, an impression now that some of the male virtues are somehow wrong or faulty or that are things that we should not aspire to. Um, boys are judged against feminine standards in schools and then drugged up when they don't com comply to them. Is it one in six, one in seven American kids is on, uh, is on Ritalin? I mean, it's horrifying statistics. We're drugging an entire generation of boys, and lots of people have written about this over the last 20 years. Later on in society, as they get older, men are punished for other male virtues too. Um, the fact is that you know, it's easy for us to sit around and have a, 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 you know, a, a spirited intellectual debate about these things. So society requires and relies on many of these male virtues, competitiveness and phys physical aggression and strength. I mean, the studio we're sitting in was built by men. You don't see many women queuing up to drive oil trucks or lay bricks or, or be, what are those guys yeah. called in the, in the skies who polish windows 60 floors up. Women don't want to do those jobs. And the entire physical environment Thank around us is Mark. built what, by men. And yet we constantly I, I whinge about these virtues that men there's have. No, there's no way that we could ever agree on things, um, Milo. I mean, I do not understand what, I mean, I do not accept that there, there is such a thing as a masculine virtue. I mean, are you saying that there's no competition between women? That is to say, you, you, you suggest I'm saying women that, are prone to the same degree of competitiveness that men are. So, I mean, why is competitiveness, uh, competition, you know, a, a masculine, why do you define it as a masculine virtue? Well, because it seems to predominantly happen in men. So I call it a masculine virtue. I'm not, I'm, I don't know whether there's a biological reason for that, but it's, I mean, I, I don't think it's something that many people would seriously disagree with, that men tend to be, men, you know, tend to have this sort of obsessive, competitive, 
uh, aggressive thing in them that most women don't. I, I don't think that's a. So do you think there's a biological base for that? Because if, if maybe there is, I don't know. Well, there isn't. <laughs> there isn't. Well, if, <laughs> <laughs> you'd, you'd say that. Uh, <laughs> of course, you would say that. Um, I have no idea. Maybe. I mean, there are books coming out now that, say, that suggest that, contrary to consensus of academics, there is a biological basis for race and possibly. But who writes those books? Are they academics? Well, themselves? the ones that the, the person who wrote that book was the former science correspondent of the New York Times, which is not somewhere you would ever imagine to uh, ima ever imagine somebody uh, coming from and writing as a biological basis to race. So I think the fact is that nobody really knows. You say there isn't, like you could know. You don't know. Um, we, we, we don't have the foggiest idea about the genome. We've only just started mapping it. It's only been the last what, 10 what years trying to say? we've had the computer processing power to even work out you know, where people come from in the world based on DNA samples. You cannot possibly know any of the things you're asserting. I, 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 what I'm trying to say is to return to um, uh, Pallia, is that Pallia does have a very strong sort of argument when it comes to the way things were. And this is, this is no, um, it's no um, question she starts from uh, the you know, ancient times. And of course, you know, um, the, there is a case in which it, you know, it can be supported, that it can be argued rather, that um, you know, men used to be a lot more competitive, all these things that you describe as masculine virgins or whatever. Mm -hmm. But this is not the case anymore. And are you saying that for the last 20 years, there's, there's been a way of um, inverting this social schema and now we have to turn back because it's not doing our society any good? Yes. Yes, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying the, the, the competitiveness and obsession uh, of men, which shows itself in their preponderance in certain subjects, universities, and certain professions, has put us on the moon. It built the pyramids, it built cities, uh, it built the internet. <coughs> men did that, and part of the reason they did that is, uh, you know, is these, what I call the masculine virtues. Well, of course, I mean, if, if, that's, this, if that's the way to, you know, that men did all that, men, men did other things too. Yes, men, men do did, terrible things too. You know, world you know, wars, well, this is, this is this is the genocides. this is the problem with men. Yeah, you know, yeah. if you, you know, the IQ distribution graph, which you'll know about, of course. You know, the, we, there are more sublime geniuses, but also more knuckle draggers. This is why men um, are all the great artistic geniuses in history, with very few exceptions. But they also fill all the prisons. Mm. You know, this is the the double-edged sword of um, you know of being a man. But to say that it's somehow better, to, you know, women tend to cluster around the mean um, as far as IQ goes. You know, sort of you get 50 men and 50 women, the sort of average amount of IQ will be the same. But it's most women cluster around that 100, and men, you know, you get more, more as I say, more geniuses and more, more um, knuckle draggers. But the point is that um, those men at the top, and there are fewer women simply because of the way that IQ is distributed. Um, other ones who well, really push that, that there is there is a, a case in which the, the w w women have got how can I put it middle brow IQs and then when it comes to men they've got well, that's high brow that's the IQs or, or, well, the or yes the, suggest the suggestion from IQ distribution and G distribution as well and they're not perfect measures but they're you know they they're pretty good indicators of some things um, yes the suggestion from those distribution graphs is that um, the male graph is shallower so you get more men men with IQs of over 160 than you get women right so the female graph is taller because why more do you trust this this kind of research and not the other kind of research uh, well, what kind of research is produced here, for instance? Well, uh, um, I think when you see something that runs contrary to all the evidence of your senses and experience, you have to question it more, more, more carefully. Oh, um, and this, you know, this piece of research, which is fear-mongering and incredibly, you know, obvi obviously and transparently politically motivated. Um, yes, I do approach that with scepticism, whereas if I read in a, you know, in a science textbook about IQ distribution, I'm much more likely to take it at face value. But the interesting thing about these debates is that you're not allowed to have them. The president of Harvard had to resign for talking about uh, intelligence distribution in, uh, in boys and girls, for making one joke in a speech. This is you know, one of the greatest academic institutions in the world. Just to give you an indication of how dysfunctional this debate has become, um, you know, he had to resign merely for alluding to it. And that's why it takes gay guys to stick up for boys. Okay, Theo, would you... Do you see lad culture as a renewed form of sexism, would you say? If, if lad culture is what I perceive it to be, then I do, of course. You know, I mean, Milo has not yet described at, at, at what point, I suppose, you know, um, men stop being um, boisterous and are being downright offensive. Men, men are pigs. Yeah. Men are pigs. But there's nothing necessarily, you know, but that doesn't mean that we should ban them from things or pathologise their behaviour or shame them publicly. I wouldn't say pathologise, um, but, you know, well, that's when... exactly what happens when we put them on drugs. I mean, how else do you describe it when you put a generation of young boys on Ritalin? If you put a generation of young boys on Ritalin, what are you doing um, besides pathologising them being they, boys? But listen, they're putting boys on Ritalin not because they don't want them to be women, as it were, because there are no um, structures and support out there 
to deal with students or with young pupils who are really problematic. It's no, a, it's, it's, it's not the problem. Issue. The problem don't want to turn them into no, women. no, no, no. That's absolutely not the case. No, the I problem is that the, the is the misbehaviour, problematic behaviour, um, has been has been so. Uh, has been redefined so broadly that it basically encompasses all boys. Well, I, 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 as I say, I don't agree. I mean, those. I mean, I'm an educator, yes, and I've got. And as an educator, you I've, can't. You I've, must realise there is something wrong with a system that puts whatever it is, twenty percent, ten percent, any <laughs> any double digit statistic no, of I, its young I people on drugs. What I do, what I do, I, I don't, I don't. But I don't, I don't agree with your point that this is done because. Uh, in order to somehow um, uh, roughen up the edges of, how can I put it, of men who uh, otherwise they would be too uh, feminine as it were. Uh, but, but what I do, um, wh where I do have a problem with when it comes to the statistics is that 27% according to this report, 27% uh, of women have been harassed according to what they perceive of har as harassment. Yes. If they perceive it as harassment, then it is harassment. No, it's not. Absolutely let, let, not. Let me, let, me just, let me just finish. And what happens is this, that when, um, um, as an educator, when I translate that into numbers, that means that um, 15 of my female students, my women students, this year have been harassed in my class. But it's not true. Board. But it's not true. These women have been told that harassment is, you know, can, can, can be, yeah, you know, is... Uh, <laughs> Is so broadly defined they can claim anything. Look at this false, you know, false rape claim after false rape claim after false rape claim in the media. I don't all see the time. That. I mean, Sussex because suffers over there, you know, in that little. Uh, well, the Duke Lacrosse scandal. There were five since, and then last week, the um, Jackie at the University of Virginia, and a whole for a whole fraternity still on suspension. No punishment for her. No punishment for the journalists who falsely uh, repeated a totally fantastical claim of of, of rape. Um, you know, which indicates to us where that where you know where where people are defining sexual harassment or what women think they can get away with. I mean, you know, if you if you start this with the pre, pre, the presupposition, which I find incredibly patronising and offensive to women, that all women are victims, and that you know these you know these women. Nobody's are, saying that. Well, I'm saying that you know, if, if you start think. if you start from that position, you're incapable of seeing women as the bad actors in some of this, and they are. And very often, women claim uh, harassment where there was none. And very often, you, women say, I feel yeah. harassed, which is effectively meaningless. What, what I'm trying to say is I don't think, I don't place them as victims or as potential victims. The only thing I'm going, uh, 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 the only thing I'm taking as, a, as my canon, as it were, is the fact that 27% of women say that they feel to have been harassed. Now, if they feel they have been harassed, then are you saying that they're doing it because they want to get away with it, or that I'm they saying, want to feel important? I'm saying what? that they need to grow up. What I'm saying is, um, the, 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 and, and do what? Allow men to say things. No, to them, and them, not first of all, not use their sexuality as a weapon, which many of them are. They get approached by men who are already incredibly timid about approaching them at all. There are these, all these new rules about how men are allowed to. Uh, relate to women. Nobody ever tells boys these rules. Nobody know. No, these boys don't know. They go up. They might ask a girl out. I mean, you know, you're talking about statistics from the sort of place that says that unwanted sexual approaches constitute harassment. That's the, in that definition. Like, well, you'd have to like close down nightclubs if you don't want that to happen anymore. A man approaching a woman and being rebuffed. You know, in my mother's generation, the woman would have said, "Get lost." Today. She's off to the she's off to the uh, you know the the guidance counselor's office and f filing a sexual harassment cl claim, and the only difference between the the men that she says yes to and the men she says no to are whether she's sexually attracted to them. Sexual harassment these days is being defined as whether or not the woman is interested in the man. So you know obviously what happens is the ugly unattractive guys who hit on women and get turned back get accused of sexual harassment. It isn't yeah. sexual harassment I, asking I someone else. I, I think I think I mean within that definition is unwanted sexual uh, really, unwanted I, advances. That's I, not harassment. Yeah, listen, Harrison's you know. what Bill Clinton does, grabbing an, inter grabbing an intern's hands and putting it on his erect penis. I don't see much of that going on in campus. Yeah. I, I, I don't know what to say. I mean, I, I you know, this is sort of... Um, <sighs> there's so many things wrong with you know, <laughs> what you've said to me. I don't know where to start. You <laughs> said to me, first of all, <laughs> you said to me that <laughs> women use the sexuality as a weapon. Yes, I think some, yes? some of them do. Some of them. How many? 
If you define harassment as whatever somebody feels harassment to be, you'll never be able to answer any of those questions. Well, listen, if, if you're saying that women use their, um, how can I put it, their sexuality as a weapon, this is a statement of fact which demands more scrutiny, which you're not able to give at the Well, moment. fine, although the, uh, the, 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 the dozens of fake, at, fake rape cases on, um, at the same time, on at, campuses, there's your example. At the same time, let me give you another, make it, sort of pose another question, if I may. You know, I, I saw the other day a little... Um, um, those things that um, uh, onesies that young babies wear, and they're yeah. literally for young babies now. Yeah. That one of them adult style. Uh, no. Do they? Oh. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't know any of them. Anyway, so um, so sure there were sure. sort of onesies, <laughs> and there was the, the one the the pink one for the, the, the for the young for the young uh, girl was uh, bore the, the the logo I hate my thighs, whereas for the the blue one for the young boy was I'm a superhero. Can you not see anything well, valid all, there? Okay, first of all, that wasn't the complete range. So you're cherry picking the. You're, you're cherry picking the. Yeah, you are. Not, you're cherry picking. That I wasn't the complete about range. The range. I don't well, care. Well, the, the range. worst example of this, the best example but of that, on some ones that, you know, if, well, there look, is, if you want to get your. Something like that. This story came from the Daily Mail, so it's nice at least to know that you read a diverse. I did not read it on the Daily Mail. No, you may not well. Somebody rewrote it there, but it's nice to have you see. Nice to hear you're taking the Daily Mail's reporting seriously, um, but it isn't serious reporting, and um, that's just a ludicrous, ridiculous example. I, I didn't read the report. Just as uh, take it as face value, you've got two at the moment when say. Um, uh, gender performance is created, if you like. A woman is characterized as one who should always feel guilty for her the, for her body. Oh, I think, and then women, another, I think women are encouraged to look good because men are visual animals, and if women want to get the best boyfriend, they have to look good. That's because men are, you know, we like women who look good. Women like men who make them laugh, and you know, you know we have to we go for different things in the different sexes. The sexes are not identical, and if. Men, you know, are visual animals and like to look at, you know, women who look good. So women who want the best possible boyfriend are going to diet and are going to work out. So I just find that to be dysfunctional. Are you saying weird. that we men not don't have to work out on or we don't? I'm saying there aren't the same pressures. Yeah, I mean there are not. Of course. Well, they're not the same. Pr I mean, well, there are now. I mean, we have this sort of weird metrosexual culture in the last in, in the last generation. Partly as a function of what I've been talking about, men no longer know what their place is. Um, this sort of homosexualization. I, I don't know. Of men. I think I've lost it entirely. I mean, you know, there's as I said, there's so many things that I don't agree with. Uh, the other word, the the otherwise. So, if really, we're going to really bring it back to lad culture, would you say that it was a gender performance? It is a performance for sure. It is a performance. Um, one that I find, as I said at the beginning of this debate, that has, uh, that's that got really complex sociocultural and socioeconomic uh, roots. And uh, of course it is um, um, pernicious and it, of course it is a problem. Um, um, and I think, as I said, there's, there's, I, I, I couldn't believe, if it said to me when I was an undergraduate, that in the 21st century, 2015, I would be baiting, you know, um, these issues with um, um, a man who's um, with another man. Then I, I, I would say to you that there's no way. There's no way, you know. I, I can't agree that you know this stuff is is intrinsically pernicious at all. I think some people behave badly to characterise, you know, this whole generation of young boys as pernicious and in need of fixing. I don't, and this, well, I don't, did. I don't, um, you just not did. the boys, is, is not I, the I, boys, you know, I, I find not that, the boys. I find that really troubling, um, you know, and it sort of proves my point about boys getting, um, <laughs> boys getting pathologised and being held up to feminine standards, like, you know, this is pernicious and it needs to be fixed, which is both what you're saying and the message of this report too, you know, from the executive summary right through to the last page, you know, we've got to do something about these men. Um, you know, the fact is that uh, being on a, uh, university campus one of the safest places you can be. Um, of course, you know, women, of course. You know, it's one of the safest places you, you can not be. Would you agree then that, um, for example, the incident of violent sexual assault, like serious stuff, I'm not talking about, you know, somebody brushing up against a breast in a bar, who cares? I'm talking about... I don't think that women care either. I mean... Well, they do, because they complain They complain to people like this, but um, they've, been, they've been taught they can use it afterwards. They don't care at the time, but they've been taught they can use it afterwards. Um, I don't know do, you you get do, you, do you agree that um, violent sexual assault on campus is much lower than the general population? I wouldn't know. 
I would not know. You wouldn't know. Uh, I would not um, know. Because what we're expected to believe is that it's much higher, right? We're expected to believe that one in four or one in five, depending on who you believe, you know, women is, is you know, has, has a serious problem at, um, at campus. This stuff just isn't true. And so much of this debate is driven by stuff that isn't true. And if you believe all this stuff and you think, well, I guess it's all right, people have looked into this, then of course you get the idea there's some sort of problem with boys. But there isn't. Um, there isn't a problem with boys on campus. You know, the, 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 the only problem really Milo, is the I other way around. You, I mean, honestly, the peep, if... If a young woman says she has a problem with a certain kind of behavior, then there is a problem. No ways. This is. Well, it, this may, is a, it may just be a problem with her. You have to accept the possibility that her complaint does not have merit. You cannot define uh, sexual assault or harassment as purely the feelings of the victim. You just can't because they can be wrong. Or they could, or it could have been a misunderstanding. I mean, this is the whole point of this sort of, you, you know, these fake rape charges, that are drunken fumbles that end up in a lawsuit. Um, you know, people can be wrong, and they very often are. I'm not and saying in that, that there are no such things. Of, of adolescence, alcohol, um, you know, and all of those other things, there are misunderstandings. There are sex that you know neither person really wanted to do. This stuff, you know, is is the sort of stuff that shapes you. This is the sort of stuff that you know, it's a bit. It's a bit shitty at the time, but it's not, you know, it doesn't traumatise you for the rest of your life. And people who claim it does are out to get something. As I'm saying, I don't, I, I'm not saying that, um, um, I, I don't seek to pathologise men. I do not seek to pathologise boisterousness. I do not seek to um, uh, pathologise, you know, uh, to use um, an older phrase, sort of sowing one's oats, as it were, you know. That's not the problem. The problem is when that becomes offensive and presumptuous. This is your where, standard, where your standard is of offence is so absurdly low that um, certainly I'd be guilty of it on a daily basis. Um, you know, I mean, it just makes me think. Well, what do you want? To, what do you want done to these boys? You know, you say you say you see if this is a problem, then presumably you want them punished or I don't, you want some I just sort of want sanctions. To stop. What I'm trying to say well, is stop, stop doing so, what? I okay, mean, you know, stop but, making but, women feel okay, offended. I mean, to invert good luck this, with that. But to invert this question of yours, what do you want to do with these women? I mean, I luckily I'm a man. I've done fall prey to these things. I'm never going to be asked whether I feel... The very fact that you have to actually raise no, the question... In, I, think feel, I think that's in itself sexist. But, you're but saying you're a man, you'll never I'm, have to feel unsafe. No, what that's, I'm trying to that's say... That's just rubbish. That's, so, Milo, no. would you say then... That's sexist. Could a man say that he'd been harassed by women? Or, or of course men are harassed by women all the time. We just don't want to hear about it. I mean, you know, there's a whole phenomenon of... There is a whole sort of dark, dark uh, unspoken about phenomenon of, but, <laughs> of women raping just, men. Just this question, if you didn't mind. So... You ask me, what do I want to do with these boys? Yes. Yes, pathologize them, punish them, or whatever. You know, what do you want to do with these women, young women who say they feel Send them uncomfortable? Away. Send them away with a book by one of the, you know, feminists of the 60s who said... Like who? Don't go, you know... Don't, well, I do like Camille Paleo. I think she, you know, her argument is quite compelling. If you co if you cover these girls well, in Cornwall well, in university, no. when they go out into the real world, they are at, at such high risk of something really serious happening. So, what I would like to tell these girls is, is I very think it's straightforward. Misread Paglia. You know, Paglia talks about conflict. She does not apportion who is right and who is wrong. She is saying that the relationship between the uh, gender relationships, you know, for hundreds of years, millennia in other words, you know, you know, have been, uh, has been one of conflict. Now, yes. um, the thing is this, that we don't live in this, luckily, luckily, we have gone, we have advanced from the stage where we would club a woman, you know, and then drag her into your cave, so to speak. Luckily, we have advanced from that. So, do you want us to return to that? No, but what I'm saying is, um, <laughs> no, uh, what she says is that men are violent and dangerous. That is wrapped up, it's essential to male sexuality. It's what women find attractive about men. They, you know, they like the bad boys, they like dangerous men. It is an integral part of all of the best sex, is a frisson of danger. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, such an, it's such an essential part of who we are. Um, I kind of feel like you want to stamp all of that out. And you I want don't. To, you I want to don't neuter that. boys. No, so, so, you know, no, and and, and what, look what's happened. No, no. Look what's happened. A generation of metrosexuals that no woman wants to settle down with because he uses up more shelf space in the bathroom than she does. Metrosexuals um, are not dangerous. or you know, No, and that's the, pro that's the problem. That's why no women so, want them. That's why they're all single. Yeah, I mean, that's... that's, that's, that's they're all single. That says a lot more about them than women. No, it doesn't. It says, that, it says that women don't want them. It says women don't want them because they've turned well, themselves can, into feminized men. Uh, how do we... As the lady in Hamilton would have said, you know, gay men in all but the sex, right? 
uh, you know, G the sorts of men who read GQ, which is a gay magazine for men who happen to have sex with women, right? Um, this, is a, this is a generation of men we've bred. And they're not very interesting. They're not very exciting. No one's going to accomplish great things. And women don't want them. And I don't want young boys, I don't want this next generation of young boys to be even more screwed up than that. And in answer to your question about what we do with these women, we take them into an office, we shake them and say, stop it, grow up. If you don't like it, turn around and tell him where to fucking go. Um, excuse my language. If you don't like it, tell him where to go and get on with your life. Don't, you know, wander in the next day to some sort of committee, report him for sexual harassment, report him to I the police. I don't think they do that, Milo. I don't think the women who actually say they, they have reports, been harassed report, report were actually... Are you saying that now women don't, don't, say, don't just tell men where to go instead of which to say, oh, do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go right, you know, tomorrow and I'm going to report you to campus. Do. There are, of course they do. There are women's officers on every university campus that practically coach people into making false rape reports. That sounds incredibly conspiratorial, but look what actually happens. Look at how many of these things fall apart under scrutiny because a woman a woman was told if after the event she changed her mind it about the whole fall scenario apart under scrutiny it falls apart because there is an uh, victimization you know women are supposed to, you know I mean if you were if one if I were a, a young woman who say had been harassed or in a or you know um, raped so to speak do you think with a current societal structure we have I would go on the next day and report it to, to the law they do do you know how many how many uh, such crimes get reported? I can't remember how many tens of thousands, but you know, um, I, I've no so idea. So there are there are so there are women who don't report because they feel ashamed. Of because course. they feel they actually brought to themselves. Of course. Because they but, might have thought by people like to, you that they use the sexuality as a weapon. have got to stop making rape this thing that takes over the rest of your life. I mean, I it doesn't to. have to. I don't and want And it starts to. at university. When you tell these women that if you feel offended, you are offended. And you have every right to get somebody to go and wrap him on the knuckles and say, don't behave like that to women. When they get out into the wider world, they get raped. Because they have no idea how to deal with men. They have no idea how to operate in the real world. They have no idea how to, you know, be a woman and survive um, amidst, you know, yes, dangerous, violent male sexuality. Of course it is. That's what's so, so great about it. But it's also what makes it dangerous. Well, and women, ha women need to know how to navigate that and to keep themselves safe. But, they but they listen, will never listen. learn if, if you keep them in cotton wool and if, say that if someone looks at you wrong and you feel harassed, then that's harassed. If you argue, if you argue that there is an inherent, innate form of... Uh, male sexuality that is dangerous and uh, uh, can be um, how can I put it uh, um, can be dangerous for women. Mm -hmm. Then there's a problem. No, there? no, no, no. There's no problem unless there's an act of violence committed. It's not a problem if you know people are just being loud and boisterous and a bit gobby in a bar. That's not a problem. What I'm saying is that there are rapists out there who are way off the deep end who you know are out there to hurt, hurt, hurt women and there are you know a few of them but and women need to know but how you to said earlier just now you said that women you know um get out of university they graduate university and then mm -hmm. you know being mollycoddled in university as it mm -hmm. were and then they go out and they get raped because they don't know how they, to get to handle men. They will do if they don't know how to look after themselves. And they won't learn how to look after themselves if there's always a university committee to report a, ba a black look to. It's okay, just ridiculous. Can I just, can I just uh, if you do in mind, uh, uh, okay, if you, if you argue that men have been destroyed or have been deprived of their uh, sort of um, primordial, if you like, you know, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. danger and, mm -hmm. you know, drive or mm -hmm. sort of violence to violence or whatever. So, if they have been destroyed, how is it that when they actually leave university, they pose a risk to women? I'm talking about uh, generational trends. I'm saying young boys are having it beaten out, beaten and drugged out of them, right? I'm saying this is, you know, so yeah, well, that's why rape So you're saying that in 10 years time, we're not going to have any rape? Who knows? I mean, rape statistics are going down, uh, not going up, as, as, as uh, people like to claim. I mean, the number of rapes in university is plummeting. The number of reports is going up. But, you know, you talk to, talk to police officers and they'll tell you, we can't say this in public. I don't talk to police, but can help it. Yeah. The all, number of all crimes is going down in this country at the moment. Everything's going down. Um, you know, the general trajectory on every crime except, I think, um, I know, some white collar thing, and uh, there are about two crimes that are going up okay. at the moment. Milo, so what do you think a woman's role is in today's society then? Um, I think that it's a lot broader than it used to be, which is a good thing, and it's great. Um, women so she asked you what should be. Sorry. Well, um, I don't think there's an answer to that, really. I think women should have the opportunity to do whatever they want to do. What I do think is important, though, is that we don't try to... Inf uh, I believe in equality of opportunity, but not of outcome, right? So it's important to give women equal access to everything. 
whether it's promotions, pay, education, um, what we should be wary of doing is imposing arbitrary quotas which don't reflect the choices that women make. So, for example, in, in there's, some, there's some evidence to suggest that in more equal societies, women's educational choices are actually narrow. In places like um, Pakistan, you get like 50-50 women on science, science courses uh, as a STEM subjects. Uh, you go somewhere like Norway, and it, di it drops down to about 5%. And in more equal societies, fewer women choose to do those things because they don't have to. You know? They have every op option available to them, and they don't choose to go into those subjects. If we then try to sort of impose arbitrary quotas in the uh, jobs and professions that come after those subjects, we risk distorting all sorts of things in an unhealthy and unnecessary way. Well, I would say women obvious, obviously should um, have access to everything. They bring enormously valuable um, contributions to business, to government, to all sorts of things. I mean, having a woman in the room at uh, meetings that were pre... I've been in meetings that, uh, you know, in companies that were previously all men. Putting a woman in the room transforms the room infinitely for the better, you know? Um, we should, you know we, I would welcome all of that stuff. My only... Uh, the only caveat I have is that I, I, I see some industries, like the tech industries, the startup and, and technology industry, sort of hand wringing and killing themselves over why there are so few women. Um, the answer to that broadly is simply that women don't want to do those jobs. Uh, they don't want, when you need to put your you know, Gladwell 10,000 hours in in your 20s, they don't want to be stuck behind a computer coding. So my only worry is, you know, we don't get into a situation where we are doing positive discrimination, affirmative action, arbitrary quotas, all that kind of stuff. Let women do whatever they want. And if women primarily go into the healthcare professions and tend to leave science alone, who cares? Do you see that, do you think that men and women are equal? Yes, of course. I mean, there are differences in sexes, certainly. Um, there are differences in what the sexes choose to do with their lives. Um, there are physical differences, men tend to be bigger and stronger. There are the biological things we cannot get away from. Um, there's no point getting into sort of academic, um, uh, uh, Scrutiny. No, 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 no. Going, jumping through sort of weird, contorted logical hoops to try and claim there's no biological difference between men and women. Of course there is. Um, but there, there are differences, but they should be treated entirely equally. Sorry. Yeah, what would you say? What, what was the question? Sorry. Um, would you say that men and women are equal in terms of. Yes, of course. Of, of, course, of course there are, but you know, I, I, I do have an enormous problem with um, the way in which. Um, and, you know, pardon me, I think is a really. Uh, facile, uh, impoverished way of actually saying women choose to do. You know who, you know women, the, the profession that women choose to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, this is extraordinarily problematic. You know, it, it, it would it, it suggests that you know somehow there is some sort of coding. You know that takes place at some point, either pre-birth or immediately after birth, that programs, as it were, women into choices. Um, and that, no, of course, no, what I'm saying is that um, men and women are different, and those different aptitudes and tendencies and um, abilities and habits naturally are going to shape the sort of jobs they want to do later. Men, be you know, with their sort of obsessive, autistic competitiveness, end up in things like astrophysics and maths and philosophy. Makes sense. Women, you know, nurturing and community, communicative and all these other things we associate with, with women very often end up in healthcare professions and that sort of thing. Um, I don't see anything intrinsically wrong with that. They're both necessary components of a free and equal society. And there's no problem, there's no reason why we should be worried about different sexes is it, is choosing different career paths. Is something wrong for women who actually go into philosophy or women who go into yeah, of course not. There's nothing wrong with male nurses. No, we should give everybody the opportunity to, to enter whatever the health field they want. Um, but that doesn't mean that we should uh, worry if a field is particularly dominated by women. I mean, you don't see people complaining that, uh, you know, that, that uh, let's get more men into social work. Uh, you know, it's only ever done when it's men. And, and these aren't always necessarily the most prestigious jobs. I mean, some, some of them are quite well paid, but they're not always very prestigious jobs. They're quite often sort of effectively jobs for basement dwellers. And yet we still complain about it because it's men. In the female dominated um, industries, there is no such complaint. And I find that a, a bit weird. Okay, so finally, Theo, would you say that life culture is something to be concerned about at a university? Um, <clears throat> uh, as I said, if there are women out there, and I know there are, who feel harassed, threatened, or in any way, in any way their behaviour compromised, or, you know, by uh, uh, lads and by blokes uh, and so on, then, of course, there is a problem. Um, and 
you know, I, I, I don't. I mean, I don't think the, the world, the, the, the current problems of the world, are far bigger problems the world has at the moment than what we're discussing. Uh, and of course, it has nothing to do with uh, radical feminism, you know, as such. The problem of the world is inequality, is not radical feminism. Okay, and finally, Milo, what do you think women think about loud culture? Um, I think, as with all these issues, there is a very level-headed, sensible, common-sense majority who think I would <laughs> allow, allow be conceited to say pretty much like me. Um, you know, they don't see this as a sort of uh, terrible, awful situation. They don't actually perceive a lot of the damage that's being done at the moment, a lot of the problems that are surfacing, um, and the, the sort of rift between the sexes. They don't see a lot of that, they just have to deal with the results. They don't always know where it's come from, but I don't think that... I mean, if I think about, think through the women in my life, and the women I admire, and the women that I, you know, um, have learned from, the thought of any of them running off to a campus uh, staff member running off to the police because somebody you know, brushed their tit in a bar, it would be absurd to them, the very suggestion of it. And I think they would um, cringe in embarrassment for their sex at the sort of women who, you know, complain effectively over nothing and would also agree with me that um, defining harassment as whatever makes someone feel harassed is such an absurdly um, broad and useless definition that of course it's going to generate whatever st statistics you ever want to show about um, you know bad behavior from one person from one side okay so would either of you like to add anything else to this debate you got any no, not really I mean you know as I said there's I, I can I can we can be talking for hours perhaps next time we can a few drinks in the zoo, and we, we we too can be a bit boisterous, but um, um <laughs> but um, I wouldn't want to take you back to your roots. <laughs> ah, but the thing is that um, uh, I, I don't find I don't find um, uh, my saying that um, when one feels harassed, you know, whatever makes one feel threatened or harassed or in any way you know, uh, in danger, that's a ridiculous thing to say, you know, because... Um, uh, well, that's quite because different that, that, that goes, that goes, that goes yeah, what you just said. It's not just about sexuality or gender that we can apply this rubric. If I were um, a, a black person, if I were, say, um, if I were discriminated against, against because of my um, ethnic background, mm. you know, um, uh, if you thought that by calling me a stinking but Greek, for instance, feelings is not way to adjudicate this. I could, I, I wouldn't say this, but I could say that you know, seeing black people in the street makes me feel edgy and, un and uneven and and, uh, and uneasy. And I, you know, go to check my wallet is still there. That's the sort of thing a bigoted person might say. They might say they felt in, phys in physical danger. Um, you know, according to your definition, they're perfectly entitled to do so. And we should do something about it. No, no, they're bigots, they're wrong. Like these women who say they're being harassed with no justification, no basis, who just need to grow up, they're wrong. So can I ask you something? If, say, um, somebody from UKIP said, you know, a UKIP fellow, you know, um, said that I don't belong here because, unfortunately, I'm not British biologically, mm -hmm. yes? I, I may take umbrage to that and say I'm offended and I want something to be done about it. Mm -hmm. Another person would say, nothing wrong with that, grow up. Would that be? Would that be? Well, I think the whole the problem. The whole problem with this is the offence taking in the first place. I mean, um, you would be. There are things you'd be right to be offended about, and there are things you would not be right to be offended about. My subject. What I'm saying is that there are. You know, in the case of. No, I think you're wrong here. Yeah. I mean, if you're offended by something, if if somebody say. If we you operate know, society on the basis of hurt feelings, we're going to get ourselves into a very, very well. We're going to get. Well, we're going to see a society that looks like Twitter, and I don't think that's what anybody wants. I, I don't really. Um, I, I don't really where it came from. Unfortunately, we need to wrap this up now, but please join the debate on Twitter with the hashtag the lab debate. Oh, Twitter. <laughs> Thank you for joining us.
uh, let off steam. And by let off steam, yeah, I mean, be loud, get drunk, play sports, you know. And none of these things are uh, intrinsically offensive. I think you have an extraordinarily broad definition of offensive if you, if you find that to be difficult, okay, problematic. You. I agree with you entirely. You know, what, what's wrong with, you know, being boisterous and getting drunk and, you know, letting off steam? But when that sort of... Um, um, uh, imposes on 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 women's um, understanding of themselves and the how does it? Well, I mean, how can I put it? I mean, I could I could be graphic if you like, but when Please. in a pub, you know, um, um, you've got uh, drunk young men, you know, and mind you, I'm not saying I'm not putting myself out of this, you know, I, I used to do it too when I was younger, but. Um, not, as I said, I wasn't offensive, but, you know, when there is a situation in which a man considers it his right, a young man considers it his right to more or less presume that a woman is there for his pleasure and his pleasure alone, then what the, the, there's the problem. I mean, I've got... I would, agree, I would agree with you entirely. I simply don't think that's what's happening. Uh, I think the view that you're, uh, the picture you're painting is 20 years out of date. My experience writing on this subject and, uh, and looking into it and speaking to young men over the last couple of years paints an entirely different picture. It paints a picture of men who are very worried about approaching women. They're worried about being laughed at, about being branded creepy, about being even, in extreme cases, accused of being rapists or potential rapists. Men now have to go to university and and, um, and join compulsory consent classes. The uh, you know the underlying sort of background to which is your all potential rapists. My experience actually has been that it's precisely the opposite is the case in lad culture. This retreat into so have British universities become combative of lad culture? Today, debating this topic, I'm pleased to welcome Milo Yiannopoulos, broadcaster and columnist and Dr. Theo Caloris, a senior lecturer in media studies and critical theory. So welcome. So firstly, Milo, how would you describe a lad? Um, well, I think in this debate, lad, lad culture is um, used to mean boys who have a particular set of, of boisterous behaviours that some people think are causing problems for women or maybe difficult for women to relate to or engage with. But, Really, it's um, I would just describe it as young men letting off steam in an entirely appropriate and healthy way. Okay, and Theo, what would you say to that? Um, it, 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 it is an interesting answer. Um, I would I would suggest, however, that it is uh, it, it it is a complex cultural phenomenon, which has, um, in in my view, uh, rather deep um, sociocultural and political roots, um, and I would. Um, if you didn't mind, I mean, would, uh, I'd, I'd like a bit more of an explanation as to what you mean by boisterous. Sure. Um, well, I think in a wider context of the way that boys are being treated in society and education generally, um, men of my generation didn't experience any sort of structural disadvantage by being men. In fact, society has been architected the other way around for really quite a long time. But society is changing and changing very quickly. I don't think lad culture and boisterousness is a particularly compli complicated phenomenon. I think it's very simple. Um, it's happened you know, since there have been men, um, men of let off steam in adolescence. Um, it's, it's, very, it's very straightforward, really, that um, while men are growing up in school, being increasingly whacked on Adderall and Ritalin and Modafinil in American schools because they're held up to feminine standards of behavior. Um, if they let off steam or tear around or go a bit nuts, you're kind of getting, getting that energy out of their systems as all young boys have to as they're finding out you know, what it means to be a man and how to deal with this sort of excessive energy and all the rest of it. They're increasingly, um, as I say, being diagnosed according to feminine standards of behavior. Um, that's not normal. It's very damaging to men's psychology to, and ultimately damaging to women too because these men grow up uh, be, becoming the sort of men that women don't want to, to marry. Okay, Theo, would you then say that lad culture is something to be concerned about? Well, if, if we agree that ladism can be uh, considered, um, how can I put it, an extreme form of masculinity or one aspect of a, a, a multiple context, a multiple concept that we call masculinity, if it is an extreme um, uh, um, an extreme construct of it, then of course we should be worried. Um, but again, Milo, I mean, I, what, what, what is it, I mean, that, that, that men do or should do in order to feel, to let, what, what do you mean by letting off steam? I mean, I let off steam when I was younger, you know, I can't let off any steam at the moment. But <laughs> it's younger, harder as you I, get older, I, I right? Did, I, I did let, you know, um, off steam, but 
I, I was never offensive. Alcohol in the company of other men is a response to that. If lad culture is getting worse, it's partly as a result of the messages that men have been sent for a decade, perhaps two decades, that they are all dangerous potential rapists. And the sorts of things that you're suggesting that boys just being boys are somehow negatively affecting women um, is partly the result. I'm, I'm not, part, is, is part of the problem here. I'm not suggesting that at all. But I'll, I'll, because you, you said a couple of things that were interesting just now, you said that that you know white men were running the world. I mean, who's running the world now? What I said precisely was that things are changing very quickly and that they started changing in the last 10 years very fast. And it's a generational change. Do you men think that men and women under 30, for example, now, as I, as I, as they as they I mentioned, more? earning more for the same work in the UK and the US. That is a huge change, and it's a change that's happened very recently. So sure, perhaps in most positions of power or the rest of it, I'm not, familiar. Majority, uh, I'm, I'm not familiar. I mean, I'd, I'd like to see some data for you know the fact that women under thirty and more now in some cases because in all cases of the same work, it's not a particularly contested I, statistic. But I'm I, very I, happy to send it I've, to you. I've got I've got the gender equality report of last year's mm -hmm. you know that was commissioned mm -hmm. in the UK. Um, the UK at the moment is I mean that the study was was carried along four criteria, which was political empowerment educational attainment, economic participation, and health and survival mm -hmm. between men and women. Women, uh, the UK at the moment uh, comes, mind you, the UK is one of the eighth richest nations in the world, and out of 136 countries, the UK is 29th when it comes to political empowerment, uh, 31st when it comes to educational attainment, th mm -hmm. you know, um, I never sort of, uh, I was never presumptuous. Uh, I never considered to be my right to more or less um, force women to behave in a certain way, so to speak, or treat women. I don't think this debate is actually about women um, at all. I don't think it has much to do with women, and I think women injecting themselves into it is part of the problem. Um, boys let off seem in a certain way. We hear constantly from feminists and other minorities about the safe spaces that they need in order to have debate or simply exist uh, un. Uh, un un worried but, uh, from you know, outside influences, able to just do what they want and behave what they want. Lad culture is actually a safe space of its own and, and its own kind. It's a very poorly understood one, uh, like uh, forum culture and chan culture on the internet, which is also a version of a safe space. It's just a safe space for men. Now that concept sounds a little weird to us. So why would why would you know a straight white male need a need a safe place a safe space at all? Don't they run the world? And until very recently, they did. But things are changing quite quickly, and it's. It's left some young men feeling quite disorientated. Um, for example, you know, women under 30 in the UK and the US now earn more for the same work in jobs. Boys are, as many young men feel, and again, it's not something that my generation necessarily experienced, but lots of young men feel as though the world of work and the world of education is engineered against them. There are programs for women, there are scholarships for, for women, there are special uh, quotas for women even in some, in some companies, and men don't find that to be particularly fair. So the, seeing all of this in, in, in context I think is important. Men need their own safe spaces too. They need a, an environment in which they can, as